signals intelligence today is, is a very different um, a process to what it was during the Second World War and the Cold War. What are, what, are, what are the kinds of things that are in development now that are important in terms of code breaking and um, code encryption? Basically, I don't know. I don't know what the governments are doing. Uh, that's obviously highly secret material, mm. and I'm not privy to that. I've never had a security mm. classification. I don't know those. But the uh, crypto systems which are available in the public realm now are very good systems. You can buy off the shelf systems mm. which are very highly complex and very hard to solve. So I imagine that the governments, which much more at stake than profit or loss of a company, uh, must have even better systems. And let me add this. Uh, the United States has maybe uh, 20 or 30,000 people working at the National Security Agency. Now the government is not giving that kind of money to that agency just out of generosity. They're getting value for money. So the agency does two things. It makes codes and it breaks codes. It makes American codes and breaks codes as well, foreign mm. codes. And I don't think the government would be spending that kind of money, excuse me, without getting value for money. So I think we have very good systems and have very good people recently breaking codes as well. And presumably other nations have similar commitments to this signals intelligence function. I mean, uh, does every nation have a, a signals intelligence function? Yes. The United, the United States and the United Kingdom are very closely intertwined, very closely that way with the, as part of the special relationship. France has one. Germany has one. I don't know whether other countries do as well. Mm. I'm sure they must have them because it's in their interest to get that information. But can they break the higher level codes as the diplomatic codes or the higher level codes of NATO? I don't think so. Those messages can't be solved by Spain or Congo or smaller countries like that. Okay. And when you are in the process of wanting to break a code, presumably part of it is mathematical skill, but part of it is also obtaining original documents or keys to do that. What, what are the examples of where this has happened, where people have been able to obtain original material that enables them to speed up the process of breaking codes? During the 1950s, an American family in the Navy, brother and uncles and, and uh, uh, nephews and all that, uh, sold to the Russians information about American codes. So presumably the Russians were able to read this. This was a family which sold out of material and when they were caught, of course they were uh, convicted and jailed for a mm. while and they're still in jail. But the Russians must have gotten information uh, from these broken codes mm. and used them to try to win the Cold War, which they lost in any event. Mm. But uh, they did have uh, maybe tactical successes at the time. Fortunately, it didn't have came, never came to a, a fighting war. Mm. But they had information which, if fighting ever broke out, they would have useful information as a, bro as a consequence of these broken codes. But those, are <coughs> those sorts of advantages are tactical advantages, because presumably they have the advantage from when they have the document to when the person is caught. Correct. And then at which point the codes are then changed up and it's not so easy to change a code. People often say, well, they discovered this and now we're going to change the code. It's not so easy to change a code. You have to create a new system. You have to distribute that new system. You have to train all the men in using it. And uh, that's, there are a lot of blunders and mistakes which come mm -hmm. about that way. And when blunders and mistakes are made, that's when the other guy can break those codes. The same message has to be sent, for example, in two separate, two separate encipherments one the correct one, one the incorrect one. And with that, you can kind of play one against the other like a rough in bridge, playing one against the other. And that enables you to break codes. So people say, yes, they broke the code and uh, they're going to change the code. It's not so easy to be done. Hmm. There's almost an overhead, isn't there, with codes? Because the more complicated it is, the less well used they become, it seems. No, I don't agree with you on that. OK. Uh, I think that codes are... Uh, complicated in their internal structure, but they have to make it simple for the user. 
who are, the, who are, who are going to be using these codes? Uh, uh, these are not PhDs in history. These are ordinary kids who went through high school and maybe a few years of college, and now they're in the Army, or the Navy, or the Air Force, and they have to send these messages. They have to learn how to set the signal, the, set the system up correctly, and then type out the message. So these guys are not the complicated specialists to do it. That's the people who are doing that are back in the headquarters inventing these systems. It has to be made very simple for the people who are using it so that they don't make blunders. Because when blunders are made and the message has to be reset, resent, that's when, uh, that's, that's when the errors occur and that's when they're uh, possibly solved by the enemy crypt analysts. But in the kind of historic Cold War confrontations like the Cuban Missile Crisis or the um, several Berlin crises that there were, what contribution was signals analysis making to those other? I don't know the answer to that because yeah. that material is still classified and secret. Yeah. The only kind of information about code breaking that has come out is now 50 or 60 years old. World War One, right. World War Two, past that, that material is still retained secret because that was the year, those were the years when computers came in and that material needs to be kept secret and is still being kept secret by all yeah. major countries. Okay, and so <clears throat> in the Second World War, where was there an interplay between knowledge of diplomatic codes and military codes that contributed to victory on one side or the other? I don't think in World War II there was any significant diplomatic solutions. The Turkish codes, for example, were widely read. Everybody was reading Turkish codes. But what effect did this have? None as far as I can mm. tell. Turkey remained independent, uh, neutral throughout the war, and uh, so it really didn't have any effect. The only effect that code breaking had during the war was in the, on the, in the military realm. I don't think there was any significant diplomatic aspect to code breaking that played a role in World War II. Okay. Um, finally, what developments are there in encoding that um, are significant? Um, people talk about the number of combinations in a code and therefore it must be difficult to break. Is it, it, with computers it must be possible now presumably to generate um, infinite numbers of possibilities in terms of codes. It is possible to generate infinite numbers of codes and codes, I understand, today can be so complex that normal analysis, as was done in World War II, has far outstripped even the computers of today. So codes, I think, can be made unbreakable if you want them. Mm. One thing that seems to be coming about now, a new development, is quantum cryptology, in which quanta are, are used in some kind of electronic way to make a system which if you intercept the messages, you will, the, in, the normal recipient, the legitimate recipient, will know that a message has been intercepted. So he can take whatever necessary means are necessary to take care of, to, to, to not do what he was planning to do mm. in that original message. And this is quantum cryptography, which is just it's in its beginning stages now. So. Uh, that seems to be a new development going on. And uh, people always ask, is there an unbreakable code? There is an unbreakable code. It's a very simple code. All you need to have is you and me have to have the same series of absolutely random numbers. Then I will add these numbers to my original message. A is one, B is two, and so mm -hmm. forth. And you will add these numbers and transmit the the sum as a secret message. You at the other end, knowing the original key, can subtract them out and get the original. If, those, if that key is totally random and is never used again, that message is absolutely unbreakable. So this system, called a one-time pad, is in occasional use. It was used on the hotline between Washington and uh, Moscow. It's used by, by spies, and uh, they have these flammable little booklets made of acetate with the key on them and the, the key is absolutely random and unrepe un, non-repeated. So 
Uh, if you intercept this message, there's no way in which you can figure it out. Suppose you get the key, three, nine, six, four, five, what's the next number going to be? Hmm. It's totally random, you can't figure it out. So one-time pads or one-time systems, as this is known, are used in cases where secrecy is absolutely essential. So people say, so why can't everybody use this system? It's not possible in, say, an army system where I'm dealing with 15 different divisions and all of that, to make sure that when I sent it division one, that division two, three, and 15, all strike out that key so that it's never used again. This isn't possible. So you, in a practical sense. Mm. So as a consequence, what you, what people use, are ordinary cipher systems in which the keys are generated by machines and reused over and over again. That's why that system can't be used universally, but it is the one perfect unbreakable system and is used in some cases. Uh, but presumably if you capture the one-time pad at one end, you are then in possession of a, of a channel of communication which can be used and the person at the other end really has no way of knowing that they're not talking to the person they thought they were. That's very true. That's true. That I don't know that has happened very often, but it certainly is possible, and it may well have happened in a few cases. I'm not privy to everything that's mm. been going on in the world. But uh, yes, you're absolutely right. But if a key is captured, I mean, that works in anything. If I, mm. if I get the key to your house, yeah, I can get true. in, do you that's see? True. That's true, yeah. So, yes, but that's not cryptonite, so that's thievery. Or yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. David, thanks for talking to me today. My pleasure.